Hello everybody and welcome back to another Armies on Parade video. And as it is March, and it has been all about the last March of the Tomb Kings, we come at last to the Armies on Parade for them. So very excited about this one. Um, this is truly an army that's very close to my heart. I've been working on it for a, a long time off and on, not you know consistently through. Uh, but <clears throat> they, some of the things in this go back quite far, as you'll see. So, without much more fanfare, let's just get right into it. Alright, so we begin at the beginning with the unpainted sort of crap that's still sitting around on my shelf. Uh, there's a couple weird broken skeletons that are mishmashed together, or the, I think there's like an old champion set here out of like the the used to buy in the clam pack and a couple will there's obviously a broken down screaming skull catapult there's two others we'll see later a couple mounted lich priests because seriously who uses mounted lich priests uh and then an extra tomb king from the war sphinx box set because when you have eight war sphinxes you have a couple extras of those um so yeah this is a bunch of junk as you can see like the guys in brown are sprayed with primer so thick it looks like it's house paint, and I'm sure it probably was because those were primed, uh, I'm going to say, almost 20 years ago. So there you go. Uh, that Tomb Herald might get painted eventually. I like the guy with his big goofy standard. He, he might be the one out of this that ever gets done. All right, so now we come to not really Tomb Kings, but I felt remiss if I didn't include these guys because they, they're in the army and they're like my backup, backup skeletons. So way back in like 97... I, put, I bought some skeletons. This is long before Tomb Kings. I, I don't remember what motivated me to do this. But I thought I was going to be super clever. And I would have the front part, uh, you know, fully standing. And then they would be slowly coming up out of the earth. So you can see the back guys are just like a skull in hand. And I was so proud of myself for being so clever. Um, obviously, these are painted like garbage. Uh, it looks like... Somebody attacked them with a brush and had some sort of fit or seizure while they were doing it. Uh, they are old, they're crusty, they are just terrible, but you know, I keep them around because they make me laugh. Uh, it's always good to remember where you came from. So there you go. Obviously these are kitbashed together from like the skeletons and then as well a bunch of other pieces like the Empire kit and stuff like that. You know, just, uh, I would try the free company kit. Uh, a very classic thing to do. So, there you go. Okay, so now let's come to the actual Tomb Kings models. So this is my block of skeleton warriors. There's a few guys with whips intermingled in here. So, like, if I just want to randomly say one's a Necrotect, I can. Otherwise, it's just a hand weapon. Um, these guys are pretty straightforward. I Honestly, I've always found the regular skeletons boring. Uh, these were some of the earliest models I painted. For this army and they're okay um you know at this point i still wasn't blacking the edge of my bases or, or darkening the edge of my bases i was just leaving them you know sort of whatever color had been hit with the primer and you can see how there was differing colors of primer or whatever used there and wash that spilled over the edge and it just doesn't look good i also wasn't painting the sand uh fun thing about this army is because i did it over such a long length of time there's a lot of techniques that I kept evolving and changing, and one big one is the grit that I use. Like, the way I make my sand and the way I do desert bases has evolved greatly. So, like, you can see just in this unit how there are, like, a couple different grit types and bases and things like that. And it's going to continue to evolve as we go forward. All, all the techniques will change and shift and stuff like that, because that's what happens when you when you do an army over several years and keep coming back to it. You keep trying different things, as well you always should. Um, I don't have a huge number of Skeleton Warriors ready to go. I probably have about 70 or 80 total, including those crappy guys you just saw. Um, but I just, I never tended to field huge blocks of these guys, so it really wasn't necessary. And of course, what would the Tomb Kings be without their archers? So here is my, my archers. Again, not a huge number. I, I actually have less of these. I have, this is like 31 of them or something, and then I've got maybe 10 more that are just kind of in bits still. Um, I just never bothered to even put together. So I didn't like, I didn't want to take a picture of just a bunch of bits in a thing. Uh, but I just, 
you know, they're fine. This is where I was, like, honing and practicing the doing bone and stuff like that. I always tell people, like, if you want to learn to paint and layer, uh, just do skeletons. It's like working with sushi, how you're only allowed to do rice for a couple years. You should only touch skeletons in the beginning because you learn the musculature and how everything is split up and where it connects, what to highlight because it's just the skull. And, you know, what you're picking out when there's skin laid over is effectively what the skull is making or what the bone structure is making be highlighted. Uh, so it's it's good practice. Um, I think these guys still look okay. I'm not incredibly depressed with them, but there's a lot of things that change as we go through. Uh, my Skeletal Horseman. Uh, this is a mix of, like, there's a couple archers mixed in here. I just use them as either. I never really felt the, the need to have a differing set of these guys. They were fairly worthless. I mean, I think when they first started, they were probably Skeletal Horsemen. And then by 8th edition, they had become universally Skeletal Bowmen. But I wasn't going to rip their arms off. I don't really care either way. They're probably some of the most depressingly unimpressive models in the whole range. Um, but I tried to, to, you know, spruce them up a little here and there. Uh, I don't, I, I certainly don't hate them. I, uh, they're fine. Um, again, you can see, like, lots of things, like, I'm still not doing the side of the base and stuff like that. But I think on the whole, you know, the bone doesn't look terribly bad, and most of them seem to be pretty okay. There's a couple where I just clearly had changed my technique when I was trying different things, and so they looked much dirtier or different colored or stuff like that as I was playing around constantly trying to see what way I liked doing the bone. So, like, on the right side, you can see in the back and in the front, the second guy in from the... the right side in both cases is darker and looks more grungy all right so now we begin the good stuff the chariots uh i've got a lot of chariots uh and here's a fun thing so i and you'll notice they there are all sorts of different sort of assemblies that is to say many of these only have one guy even though all the chariots are supposed to have two uh when i first got a bunch more of this army I didn't have enough skeletons to, because I got it second hand, I didn't have enough skeletons to fill every chariot with two people, so I was just like, nah, it's close enough, whatever, it doesn't matter, it's a skeleton and a chariot, you get the idea. Um, I also didn't have enough bases, so if you look in the middle at that horrendous base, that is a piece of cardboard cut to size with some masking tape sloppily thrown around it and then just like, called it a day and glued on, and I mean barely glued on some sand. That is some lazy garbage right there. Boy, oh boy, was I giving about a D-level effort on that thing. Uh, which is a shame, because I do love these chariots, but... Apparently I don't love them enough to actually try too hard all the time. So, you know, it was fun to just play around and make a base, but I think I would probably do it a little differently if I was to do it today. So there's three down. Alright, next three. Uh, again, like, you can see, like, the banners on the side, or the, you know, the little bow holder and spear holders. Uh, two more of the crappy... We got some sand near them, cardboard garbage bases, so that's always fun. Uh, they, you know, hey, they've lasted several years, so, you know, whatever. Um, but, uh, these guys clearly are not quite up to what I would call, uh, standard. But uh, it's funny to go back and look at them and be like, oh boy, I can't believe I ever thought that was a good idea. All right, next three. Um, here's proof in the pudding that I didn't have enough skeletons because I had just like some bodies. So the guy on the left and the guy on the right are like, those torsos are I think dark elf torsos. Uh, like it looks like dark elf armor. If I remember right, I had a couple extra like dark elf knight torsos. So I, I just was like, yeah, it's close enough. Just shove some skeleton heads in there and uh, some skulls and call it a day. It makes them look very funny, I think, when the skull is just poking up out of the little dark elf uh, armor. So that that brings us up three more. I don't know what we're up to now. Uh, many more. Twelve, let's say. Sounds about right. And then these are the three I did for the last March of the Tomb Kings. So I think we can definitely see the evolution of the, the process, um, the coloration, the blends are a lot smoother. Um, everything is a lot brighter. The way I do the gold changed. But ironically, even over this month, just doing a month solid of Tomb Kings, I found new ways to do gold. Um, so literally in the last month since I started this project and now, I have completely changed the way I do gold. Uh, so I probably need to do another hobby cheating video on that. Um, but it's just a point that like you should never stop trying to experiment and evolve and push yourself and try new things. 
because you could land upon a technique that you really like and that ends up being uh, something you can really utilize to you know improve everything going forward. And it doesn't mean you got to go back and update all the old stuff. It just means going forward you've got a better technique in your pocket or maybe even just a different technique in your pocket. All right, so this is my Tomb Herald's Chariot. Um, not a thing anymore, uh, but I guess now he would just be a Tomb Prince in a Chariot or something. But back in 8th edition, obviously, well, I, to me, a lot of people poo-pooed Tomb Heralds. I always loved them because you could put them in Chariots, and I thought that was an overlooked thing. Um, my big Chariot blocks were always character-walled, like a Bretonian Lance, because I was a dirty, dirty cheater. So I would have, like, you know, two Tomb Heralds and a Tomb Prince in a in a in the the front rank of the chariot so they could only be called out and attacked and you know the heralds could like absorb wounds on the prince and stuff like that and then after they were done i'd just step up a champion and still make them allocate attacks and all sorts of stuff like that it made chariot blocks like really durable um because they just had a very high number of of, of wounds you had to pound through to get to the actual meat of the unit uh, but i like this one this was uh, some of the early freehand I tried with the Tomb Kings, and honestly, I think it came out okay. I like the little scorpion and the little sort of runic stuff up on the banner. It's kind of hidden behind his two front banners, um, but you can just see the scorpion in the middle if you look up top. Um, it's a good example of, like, you know, freehand doesn't have to be amazing to, to look good. If I was going to do it again, I'd make the scorpion bigger. Um, but other than that, I don't, I don't hate it. And all I did was just pop open the Tomb Kings 8th edition book and you know, find a picture that I thought I could roughly draw, sketch it out on paper a few times, and then drew it onto the banner and called it a day. Um, so I, I always encourage you, like, go, if, if you've got a big space like that, do some freehand. Knock it out. You can do it. You can draw runes or symbols or shapes or something. I promise you, you can. Anybody can. You can do it. All right, so then, of course, we've got the Tomb King and the Chariot. Still a very valid model. Um, I added some extra little wrapping to the uh, horses because I wanted them to look a little more special. Uh, I love this particular Tomb King model, uh, the one with the like sort of bird on his shield, um, the big hawk or vulture or whatever it is. Uh, I think it's a fantastically awesome looking shield. And I love this model too, like just I think he looks cool, I think the Kopesh is a cool weapon. And I wanted, and I was sort of inspired by the old Arcan uh, chariot that used to have wings and stuff. So I wanted to make my king's chariot, the, you know, the winged chariot, even though it's not flying around the board like Arcan's. It's just sort of, I thought, a nice imagery that made it easily stand out. Um, so this was a fun conversion. And obviously the chariot itself is converted from the um, the the uh, Palanquin or Howda or whatever you want to say, I guess, from the War Sphinx. And then just, you know, stapled on the thingamajiggy that's on the front of the chariots and that holds the, the axle and then did it from there. I think the little blades on the side are also the, those are from the Slanesh Chariot. So, you know, the point is when you start converting, don't limit yourself to just the army you're working in. Like, cast your eyes around, you know, look out, think, at, stare at your other bits for other armies. Really think about what else could I put on this model that would look cool? You know, what, what in other lines could I grab and utilize to good effect here? There's no reason when you're converting you've got to stick within the same force. All right, so the Tomb Guard. Um, you can see I have mostly new Tomb Guard, although I do have a small number of the old ones up front there. Uh, for whatever reason, I like them being the front rank because I feel like they've got those big, very heavy looking shields and they're holding them like right in front of them in a way that to me looks like they're ready to like take a charge or push forward or something. Uh, I did play this, this unit uh, fairly commonly in... Uh, back in the, the in 8th edition. I, they don't see much use on the table anymore, but uh, they're fun. I liked them. I mean, you know, you could obviously you could make a big Death Star out of them. Uh, I love the models, both old and new, frankly. I think they're both super fun. I don't know which one I like better. Um, I think they both are very characterful and, and look good. I like that weird headdress on the new ones, but I also like the sort of uh, more heavier shield and heavier look of the older ones. So I, to me, there's no right answer there. Uh, the big vulture on top of the, the random standard guy in the back is uh, one of my particular favorites. And the guy on the front right I actually often used as like my army standard bearer if I had an army standard bearer in, in there. I didn't usually, but if I did, he was the guy. And uh, that banner that he's holding is actually the thing that goes on the back of the War Sphinx. Uh, that kit is endlessly valuable 
for providing differing things. Like that War Sphinx kit was just pound for pound fantastic. With all the extra bits you could get, you could make, you know, a War Sphinx and a Hyro Titan if you're clever, and you could take off the banner poles to make you know, and a, a really awesome standard bearer. It's just the, the parts that came out of that thing were top notch. All right, so my Tomb Scorpions uh, assembled and painted over probably the longest period of time besides the skeletons. Um, the first guy is from way, way back in whenever the Tomb Kings first came out. As you can see, he's got his hands around, I believe, a Bretonian Knight. Uh, that poor guy, he didn't make it. It's a shame. Uh, there's a good example of not going all out for the basing. Like, I've got the big dead guy, but the blood just looks flat. That was all done in, you know, pre-Blood for the Blood God time. That thing was probably 2004, 2005, somewhere in there. And uh, then we moved over to the guy on the very left, who's being ridden by the skeleton. That was just a fun little thing. I wanted to, you know, spice up the, the scorpion, break him up a little bit. So I thought, why not have a guy with some chains, just surfing him around? You may have noticed when watching, looking at my armies, I like like sort of surfing models i like you know when you've got the the shark surfers i showed you the snake surfers that are going to show up in this army it's just funny to me i saw this as like snake surfer light scorpion surfer so there you go and then the guy in the back the green one is my newest one that i completed during the last march and uh he was a lot of fun and i've got a tutorial out there if you about how to build a big base like that um how to get the you know way up off the ground so there you go all right, my birdies, uh, the Carrion. I've always loved Carrion. I thought these were the underrated champs back in 8th. These were Chaffic, extraordinaire, especially once the Nagashwa came out and they regained the ability to actually march. Uh, but I always loved the Carrion. I thought they're really cool models. I know a lot of people think they're ugly, but the like sort of weird half-dead vultures I thought looked pretty cool. The guy in the center was one of my earlier attempts at, like, OSL. I was trying to make it look like the skull was glowing. Uh, yeah, it, it didn't really work. It looks like he's just got a giant green torso. No, you can't really... You cannot tell it's supposed to be a glow effect, but that's all right. You know, again, you got to fail a bunch of times before you succeed. Um, but I like how these guys came out. I think the muscles look okay. Um, it was a fun chance to, to paint open exposed musculature which is always an interesting sort of thing um and of course another dead empire man there with his his head removed or pecked off the, the many members of the empire have fallen to be basing fodder for my armies i am what can i say they just chop up so easily ah slightly unusual one here in uh my tomb king's hex wraiths so i uh when, when Nagash came out, I was like, oh, I'll integrate a couple of Vampire Counts units. Now, I didn't want anything fleshy. Fleshy things don't belong in the Tomb Kings. Uh, but I wasn't opposed to having some ghostly things. I could see ghosts in desert stuff. So I converted these over. Um, they have some weapon conversions, obviously, to have the more Tomb Kings weapons. Um, they're using, like, a mix of, uh, of various troops uh, things. I think, like, one of them has... One of them might have, like, a new Shabti weapon, probably. Uh, the one that I was so clever and felt proud of was the second from the right, who's holding, like, the, um, the Death Wizard, the Empire Death Wizards, or Amethyst Wizard, whatever he is, his, like, scythe. And I felt so clever when I did that. And then as soon as I searched around, like, I converted it, and then I searched around for various, like, ghostly painting schemes just to see if there's anything unusual I wanted to do and how other people had painted these. And I saw, like, 20 other examples of people who had stolen that weapon and done this. And I was like, oh, yeah, not as clever as I thought I was. Um, but it's relatively simple. Most of it's just the, it's the Tomb Kings horses. And then there's some Tomb Kings head swaps and more Tomb Kings type weapons. But other than that, no, they're just painted in the standard sort of, you know, nilic oxide and green and stuff. And with the tips of their weapon being slightly golded to, to glow with like a really thin gold glaze. Uh, I think they look okay and, and they're fun. I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't mind trotting these guys out now, or and they're certainly fun in Eighth Edition. Gave you some good options, so I think they came out okay. Although ghosts are boring to paint, and I hate them. All right, so now we come to the first of the snakes. So the uh, these are my roll stalkers, uh, a word that Lord Tremendous could never say. Um, one of them is like looking way down because I actually forgot the back of his head. I forgot to glue together the total head. I just took the face mask and glued straight onto the neck. 
Whoops. That's what happens when you don't like bother to ever read instructions, which, you know, let's face it, I never did. Um, but I like how these guys came out uh, quite a bit. Uh, the look of it, the, the color scheme was actually, I think, off of like the way By Painted did it. Um, he had a tutorial where he did it. And I, I was watching and I liked his red, so I thought, oh, I'll do a unit like that. Uh, I wanted these guys to look a little different coloration than the rest of the army to make them kind of stand apart. Uh, it's always interesting to me to have units that just kind of have their own distinct scheme and, and thing going on. And so uh, I decided to go for that. I was very happy with the light lines with like the yellow glow there on the on the front guy. You can really see that like great reflection line. I think that, that was probably the thing I was most proud of with the, with these guys. Again, shame I'm not edging the bases. All right, snake surfers. Uh, so these were my first snake surfers I did. Uh, this is one of my favorite kits ever. Uh, I love the snake surfer kit. I wish he took up more space on his base. Um, so much of the base space is taken up by just those long windy tails, but I do love them. Um, but, uh, you know, I didn't really, uh, I, I wasn't really sure how I was painting them yet at this point. So they're kind of a weird mix of like what's ivory and what's blue. I'm not sure it totally works, but whatever, it's fine. Um, these I kept pretty straightforward into how they're supposed to be assembled. Like I didn't add anything else. Um, one thing I really don't like with these guys is I left the rocks kind of gray. Like those are real, those are real legitimate rocks. Now they're still painted. I mean, you can probably tell like there is paint applied to them. It's not heavy, but they're like washed and dry brushed. Um, they're not primer or anything. I, I literally just took the rock and painted over it. And I, in the end, it, I don't like it. It's, it's a great point of don't put stuff on your base that isn't painted. If it's like natural stuff out in the world, the same really goes for like grit. And th all throughout this army, with exceptions of the brand newest stuff, I was in the habit when I first did this of just putting the sand on and calling it a day. The problem is it just looks flat. And you can see it here, that sand looks really flat because those grains of sand are real sized grains of sand. The problem is, is that they should be, that makes them horribly out of scale, right? Like one of those little grains of sand is the size of like one of those skeleton's fingers. Think about how big sand would be if you were walking on a beach where the grains were the size of your finger. It would be breaking your feet because they would be rocks, right? So you like not having it painted, it doesn't, it's not reflecting the light the right way, aside from the scale issue because that, that grid is way too big. It's just not, it doesn't reflect the light properly. It doesn't look like real sand, so. That being said, I do love these guys and, and I'm happy to have them. All right, next three. So this was the next three I did. And you can see I'm all over the shop here with like torso color versus hood color versus, you know, like just trying all the different paint schemes to see what I liked. Um, with these guys, you'll notice they have a bunch of different weird weapons, offhand weapons and stuff. Let me tell you right now, I don't care how they're supposed to be armed. I wanted these guys to just look as deadly as possible. So I was just throwing extra weapons on them and you know whatever you can glue their shield to their back close enough who cares um this is also the unit with that i converted to have the full snake get up right so you can see they have the full torso uh on the bottom as well as the hoods um so they've got the big shoulder pads the arms the snakes themselves are carrying a weapon uh and in the end i like this look a lot better um i i like it when you've got the full snake so, and when I, I assembled the, the next six, which was during this, this month, um, three of them sadly came pre-assembled because I got them secondhand and I didn't get the extra bits for like arms and torsos. But the other three that I got this month, I did have everything for, so I assembled them like this. Which here we go. So, three I did during the last March. Um, you can see now we've got the painted base and you can see the difference in the grit, right? It's much smaller with a few bigger chunks in it because I want it to look like kind of a rocky desert. And much smaller, the dry brushing, the washing, just very simple steps really makes a difference um, to having light play off of this stuff better. Um, again, same strategy with these guys as far as the weapons go. Like I know their offhand is supposed to be like the weird hooks they're holding on to. I've never really liked the hooks, and I, I, I've i used one or two of them, but for the most part, I, I don't do them. Um, I find the hooks onto a little, I don't, onto their spine to be silly. Uh, these are the ones that I had already gotten secondhand assembled, so no arms, no halberds, boo-hoo. 
but I still think they came out okay. And you can see uh, the difference in the gold here, especially on the snakes, where I'm, I'm changing my technique and experimenting with new things. And these were the final three I did, and I'm really happy with how these guys came out. These were in the edge highlighting video where I talked about that. Um, so you can go if you want to if you want to uh, if you want to see anything about edge highlighting and how to do it. Uh, I use these three snakes in that video. Um, I love how these guys came out. Again, having the arms, having the weapons that the snakes themselves have, it just feels like it adds so much to the model for me. It seems so much more menacing. Like, I know that the Snake Surfer isn't really attacking with a weapon. I know. But, come on. Tell me they don't look cooler. They look cooler. Ah, so now we start the real love. The Ushabti. Ushabti. Uh, the Ushabti are great. They're maybe some of the best figs. Um, that's certainly in the range. Maybe some of my favorite figs ever. Um, I have a mix of metal and fine cast. I have a lot of these guys, though sadly not as much as Doom and Darkness for now. I'm coming for you, though. Um, so I got 22 of these guys total, and I just, I love everything about them. I think it's pretty universally agreed that Jackal is the best, and I tend to agree. Although I also like the, the bird quite a bit, like the raven face one. Um, I think he looks pretty cool, too. Um, but th the sculpting on these models is fantastic. These are some of the early ones I did. So I didn't really, like, there's, you know, the gray tombstone on there. That shouldn't be like that. But I didn't really know what I was doing. He might have been one of the earliest ones I painted because you can see he's also got, like, two weapons. He was actually a conversion for a Mordheim warband. I was using, like, a, a fan-made Tomb Kings list with Ushabti in it. And so one of the things they could do was take two hand weapons or whatever as opposed to sort of a great weapon. And so I had to model him as such. And so I gave him, like, I think that's actually the zombie arm scythe but you know these for as big as these guys are their arms are not that much bigger than a normal person like scale wise they're a very strange model there's a lot of open space on their 40 mil bases i mean like just look at the jackal that's on the right side um like look at how much of his base is open on that 40 mil they really don't use the space they're a thin thin model all right so here's the next three this is uh i, I particularly like these three um, just because they're all sort of in the, the gator theme or whatever. They, the, the actual alligator one with the long nose, I, you don't see a lot of around. Um, I'm not sure he ever made the leap to, to fine cast. Maybe that, he might only be in metal, but I'm not totally sure on that. Um, but those are the wings from the Bretonian Pegasus kit, the Peg Knight. And I wanted something that really made the champion stand out. Uh, one of the things I always thought was cool about Ushabti back in, in, in old, old previous editions was that they could have a champion or whatever. And I, I just love the idea that there was, like, a champion Ushabti that stood above the rest. Because, I mean, these things have the souls of, like, great warriors and and princes and stuff put in them. You know, they it feels like they could be fairly customized. I mean, they're built from stone. Obviously, it didn't make him fly. It's just modeling. There's plenty of statues of angels in the real world. I don't think we expect any of them to start flying around anytime soon. I mean, unless they're weeping angels, which, in which case, you're dead already. All right, so here's the first six, or I, the chronological, I don't know, but here, here are six of them I did for this current month. Again, you can see the much different gold technique here um, going. This is all still just regular metallic gold, but I've switched to a, a, a non-metallic style, pushing that contrast way, way, way up on the metal from, like, highly reflective, more or less you know, the silver hard light reflections up to, or, or down to, I should say, very deep brown purple um, with the goal of, of, you know, really showing that, that incredible reflectivity um, uh, that, that would happen with, with bright gold in a sort of natural environment. Uh, I like how all of these came out. I tried to do them in three packs with sort of like each three have, would have their own consistent color scheme. That way I could split them up and make them individual units if I wanted to in the game, or I, and, and not get confused as to what who was in what unit, um, while still having them all, you know, fairly be tied together. Um, like I could shove all them together in a unit and I'd feel fine about it. So this is the other six I did. Uh, I very much like the ones in back that are like all in blue, like the super blue team. Uh, I'm not sure about the red and purple guys up front. <laughs> 
I, I, you know, when I'm painting a lot of something like this, I'm just going to experiment with color and, and see what I like and try different things. It doesn't always work out, like in the case of these red purple tinted ones. I think it's probably a bit it's it's a bit much it's they're not really contrasting colors they just feel like they don't belong together because they're too they're too close on the color wheel excuse me um but i i think that overall uh, i like how this whole group came out and i'm i'm pretty excited about them ah uh, now we begin the sphinxing so everyone who knows who has watched anything on my channel you know that i love the war sphinx one of my favorite models of all time uh i have a ton of these guys and uh, most of which i've gotten very cheaply just by slowly buying bits over time i would say most of my sphinx is costing about 10 bucks which is pretty decent um this is actually the first one i painted uh he was done a couple years back i don't know how long now it feels like forever, but it probably wasn't. Uh, but I, I like him very much. Uh, he's very simple. I wanted to go for just kind of the smooth white pearlescent effect. Um, I thought that was fine. The the rocks and such, again, don't really work. The basing on this is way off. I don't have sand everywhere. You know, he was already glued to his base, and I'm trying to shove all the grit around the model. It's a great example of why you, if, when you're doing big models like this, just do not attach them to the base, okay? it's not worth it do them separate do your base separate set the model on there when you're gonna you know draw let drop down grit and stuff like that and make sure their feet have a place to go but it's not worth it to, to glue the model on just for some small amount of convenience um if you need to have him on a base because you need to play just glue tack his feet to the base like that's the right answer all right so here's the next one i uh i painted Again, like, sometimes for off units, I'll use red in the army just because, like, in the, the actual GW army, it's sort of, they use a turquoise and red. Um, everything is turquoise and red. Uh, I don't like that as much, but I wanted to have, like, a red contingent so I could, like, sort of have a king that was red and, you know, a war sphinx that was red. Kind of a force that I could pull out that would be that, that color scheme to, to, like, a small minor force. Um... But I like how this guy came out, kind of the more fiery, orangey-red look. I think this one came out pretty pretty solid. Um, one of the things you have to do with these models, though, is really mind the gap. Um, and I can see, like, cracks, like, in his back leg where I didn't bother to fill it, and really should have. Uh, it's little things like that that bother me years later. It's worth taking the extra time. That's what I'll say. Uh, the only other thing is the little poison ball. I'm not sure it being green against this model which is very red everywhere else i'm not sure that single dot of green is really even though it's accurate because that's supposed to be the poison tail i'm really not sure that dot of bright green is doing this model any favors that's what i'll say third regular war sphinx uh i like this one this one's fun uh i converted him with the sort of i guess it's like the dragon head off of the chimera or uh, you know one of the chimera's heads I had an extra head for reasons we'll see in a little while. Uh, but I had to, like, obviously shave down the hood because it was too big to fit in there. And I thought, well, if I'm going to cut that down, why not have a guy just, you know, riding right up top, ready to rock and roll, ready to stab some people in the face. So that's him. He's up there on the uh, on the back of the, the head of the thing while his other three buddies are stabbing with the long spears. Um, I wanted this guy to look like he had kind of the lava cracks. And overall, I think I'm pretty happy with how this came out. I would do this differently today if I was going to do it again. But I'm not, uh, I'm not horribly sad with how this looks. I think, I think the effect works. It feels like there's sort of these red glowing heat lines in him. The problem is they don't really look like cracks. They're not sharp enough. Um, so that was my mistake there. And my first uh, Necro Sphinx, so, so total Sphinx count four, uh, but this is the first Necro Sphinx. Um, this guy was a lot of fun. Uh, again, like with big models like this, color scheme, I don't care that he doesn't match up. I like, I got a white one, I got a red one, I got a fire one, just whatever. Um, so this guy's purple with the lightning. Uh, purple's a really fun color to do sort of lightning effects over the top of. 
um, because you can really easily glaze over that lightning with dark purple and really sort of fade the lines and then trace it again and fade the lines and trace it again and stuff like that. Uh, because very dark purple will thin to a glaze super easy that, that has just the perfect amount of uh, shade to it because there's like no white paint in uh, dark purples. So it, it thins down and, and, act, and becomes translucent very easily. Ah, the Star Drake Necro Necro Sphinx, uh, the S the Star Sphinx, Draco Sphinx, whatever he is, doesn't matter. Uh, I did a hobby cheating on doing these sorts of galaxy patterns. Uh, I had these big extra wings, and I really wanted to to do something special with them. I had been staring at them for a while, for a long time since I did my worm gear conversion for with Skaven, and I was just waiting on the right opportunity. And this was it. I just sort of, at the beginning of this month, I had the extra dragon head, I had the wings, and I saw my opportunity and I took it. Uh, I love how this guy came out. Uh, I think the galaxy effects look pretty awesome on his wings. Uh, again, you, anybody could do that. It does require an airbrush. But I, I've got a cheating video on it. It's really not tough, and I think it produces a pretty stunning effect. Uh, so I like how this guy came out. I like the blue, too. Um, I tried to extend that pattern onto his body, and you can see the stars and things like that. And there's what he looks like from above. You can see how the, the night galaxy pattern continues on to him. So this was my Hyro Titan conversion, made out of the first uh, War Sphinx that I had. Uh, some extra wings, just because. I don't... I didn't... You know, this guy's supposed to have, like, scales in the big banner, but I gave him the big banner, but I didn't know how to hand make scales, so I was just like, meh, give him a big blade arm, it's fine. And I don't know why he's got the big wing jetpack, I can't explain that. Uh, but, you know, he's one of my earliest sort of conversions, where I was just slapping crap together and seeing how it shook out. Uh, there's a lot of different weird pieces here, like the tail flipped upside down, the bladed tail flipped upside down is, like, his, uh, is on his belt. The the actual dress he's wearing is just a full just a piece of paper that's been soaked in PVA glue and water, uh, sort of a pseudo paper mache. I would not recommend that as a technique. Uh, that's that's a hot tip. Don't do what I do. It's not good. Uh, the way to do that would have obviously been to to do some green stuff and smooth it out and make lines and stuff like that. That would have been the right answer. But I was an idiot. Um. You may notice this guy's on a round base. Um, most of my Tomb Kings are still on squares. I don't rebase things. Uh, he was not rebased either. Uh, his feet are like, I think, the feet off of the giant. I think you can do the, I think the giant, the giant comes with big hoofy feet. And so those are just kind of poking up into nothing, by the way, in case you're curious. There's, they're not connected to anything. Um, but I, uh, I, 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 had no big base for him. And I didn't know what the giant went on, where the Hyro Titan went on anyways, because there was no actual model. So, but I had this extra round base, and I was like, eh, just throw him on that. I think that should show you why AOS is probably a good fit for me, because even during an edition where bases mattered so much, I just didn't care. I just put him on, like, a square when I put him on the table, and was like, yeah, that's that's what he's on. That's, that's his facing. It's fine. It usually didn't come up. The Bone Giant. Uh, this is the original Bone Giant. He's been all converted to have a nice long cape and to have his little loincloth, which is actually a tree man's loincloth. Uh, the head is the Necrosphinx skull, which looks a hundred times better than the actual Bone Giant skull, which is stupid. Uh, everything about this model is more or less terrible. Um, it's one of the worst in the range. Uh, I'm, I'm happy I own it. I even I think my conversions make it, I don't know, slightly above garbage, but only so. Um, yeah, it's it's not great. So, more recently, during the last March, we got the new Bone Giant, and, and this I would highly recommend. So this is from Reaper Bones. Um, that giant guy is about, I think he's about 15 bucks. He's really not that expensive. And he's my new Bone Giant. You can see there, there's your size comparison between the old Bone Giant and the Reaper Bones one. Uh, and so, I mean, he's just dwarfed. The Reaper Bone Giant was great. Um, Bones models take forever to clean up, and I still didn't get it all. There's still a couple, like, mold lines on him. 
Um, but that being said, also he comes out of the box with pretty stupid weapons. Those are actually demon prince swords. Um, but I liked him with the double swords. It felt more like that image in the book of like the big tomb giant with the blades like sweeping through a, a you know a cavalry unit. Um, so and he's got his little buddy. I like I tried to put him in the same position or or you know just a little bit like that. So it looked like one was mimicking the other. Uh, something about that narrative in my head really made me laugh of the big guy swinging over top of the little guy. Uh, also, more use for the War Sphinx kit. If you look on the left, big Reaper Bones giant, if you see the scarab swarms fluttering out from under that uh, piece of rock, that is also from the, the Tomb King, Tomb Prince sort of base, I guess. It's the dumbest thing. It looks like he's standing on someone and turning them into scarabs, or the scarabs had just hollowed him out. I don't really know. I have no clue what's supposed to be going on with that base. I just know it looks dumb. But I know that if you cut off the scarabs, you can use them as, like, fluttering scarabs from under little hidden recesses. And I did that quite a few times throughout the throughout the modeling. Those are two scarab swarms. That's what they are. I hate... I These are not interesting. I show them to you only to prove that I have them. That is all. Moving on. All right, so the Casket of Souls. So this is my, I guess, actual Casket of Souls. Um, so this is metal, and it's got the old-style Tomb Guard on it, and that's the, the Keeper. Uh, I think one of his arms is replaced, maybe? I'm not sure. No, those are both legit arms. Yeah, I'm, I've, I've got a couple of those guys laying around. I did base him separately because I also liked to use him as a Lich Priest. Um, so if I, if I didn't need him as a Lich Priest, I would just set him on the back of the, you know, the casket, and that's fine, call it a day. If I did need him, like, I would just use some other caster on the back or not even worry about it, because the, the Keeper doesn't really do anything. I think, you know, he was he's just kind of there. Um, so it's not like he could be pulled off separately. So modeling-wise, it wasn't too essential. Uh, but I really like that guy as a standalone wizard. Uh, I think he's one of the better-looking sort of Lich Priest-type models. I think the basic Lich Priests are pretty boring. Uh, so if you're looking for a cool, unique Lich Priest... Getting your hands on a on a uh, keeper from the casket, I think at least, is a pretty good way to go. And uh, the leather method there that's used is more or less the same leather method that I just showed in a hobby cheating video. I don't know, a couple days ago, yesterday, no, beginning of the week. Doesn't matter. You're watching this in the future. None of that matters. Why would I argue with myself? Um, and uh, it's it's really easy to do. He's a fun model, paint, good standalone caster, especially now. He was really annoying in that pose to have him try to rank up in a unit. <laughs> like, that did not work well. But in the age of Sigmar, where everybody's on rounds and kind of free-floating, uh, I would definitely get your hands on one of these dudes if I could, because uh, I think he's a top-notch lich, pri lich Priest. All right. Two Screaming Skull Catapults. Uh, I love these guys. I think the thing I love more than anything is the big vulture at the top. Uh, of them. I, I was missing the vulture off the, the one on the left. I have no idea where it went, and it's a just crying shame. Because I'd love it if I still had it. I probably would still wouldn't have put it on top of the catapult, but I'd probably use it, you know, just in another way. That vulture is an amazingly fun bird to have perched around on things. Um, so there's those two. Uh, again, I think they came out okay. You can see, like, different types of wood uh, with this. It's a good example of, like, how wood doesn't need to be any particular color that can be light browns and dark browns and grays and have green tones in it and red tones in it and all that kind of thing and so wood is one of those things that it's fun to play around with and really all you're doing is just a mix of dry brushing and washing and stuff like that and you know getting that rich wood color out of it ah uh, yes this so this is my custom i i did you can't see it but i just made giant finger quotes custom casket of souls uh, again, with my patented cardboard wrapped in masking tape base, very top notch. And then all the skeletons climbing out of the bottom. These are some of the ghosts uh, from like Arcan's kit. I had some extra ghosts and a little, or you know. And then there's the little, I think the little, um, what do I want to call them? The little, or maybe it's from the Coven Throne. Doesn't matter at this point. But the little sort of, I don't know, for lack of a better term, spermy face ghosts. Um, those are definitely from the uh, Coven Throne. Uh, the interesting thing, unique of note here, obviously this is made totally from scratch. It's like a, that's a dice, um, that's a dice box, 
turn sideways and then you know painted that with a little glowing light which again i don't think really works but it was fun to try um to be it make it look like it's just kind of being cracked open and the light is escaping out uh i think the columns are boring and awful and i did a terrible job with those uh but my favorite part about this is the models that are on it the two tomb guards in this case are the old mummies since mummies used to sort of fill that role uh, in the undead back in the day before the tomb kings were split off and became their own army they were really represented by mummies back in the old undead book so those are obviously the mummies from like hero quest i think that and i just snipped off their bases and added some short little kopeshes in their hands and glued them down and called it a day uh the keeper the weird little like bird that bird guy if you can see him he's actually like sitting on top of the uh on top of the the casket so that guy is from a pretty cool range of miniatures it's i'm sorry i'm making noise i'm actually getting them out so it's actually from war gods it's the aegyptus uh aegyptus set from crocodile games um if you're looking for interesting figs to replace your your tomb kings models now that uh now that the gw ones have all been retired and mostly sold out uh, so Crocodile Games, the Aegyptus army, uh, has some really cool options. Like, I, I, they, they make units of those bird pelican people. Um, they all very much have that Egyptian theme. And I love this little guy. He's, like, sitting down, scribing in his little book. He just felt very keeper to me. Um, that ghost coming out of the skull on the front has broken off of this, I would say, about 40 times. Um, he's, yeah, that, that, that did not work out. <laughs> this thing is only safe when it's sitting on the shelf the second it touches the table crack goes that ghost right off the front it's just it's an inevitability all right so speaking of uh conversions of turning sort of vampire counts things uh chimerian uh this is my chimerian coven throne you know i thought I don't generally like fleshy things, but in my in my Tomb King's army, but this model was just too beautiful not to have. And, you know, Lamia is a place, and I thought, uh, why not? Why not have the, the Chimerian Coven Throne? Uh, maybe it's some vampires who've adjusted back and fallen in line under Kalita, even though she hates them and would destroy vampires on sight. I don't really know. I just know I wanted to do the model. Uh, I love how this came out. As you can see, there's several like head swaps for uh, the Tomb King's heads, and the shields have all been turned over to Tomb King shields. The banner's been replaced by like Tomb King's banners and stuff like that. And then obviously the color scheme is done in that uh, that bright turquoise that ties it in with the rest of the army. Uh, I will tell you this: if you have never put together or painted this model, and you, and you have an undead army. It's, it's worth doing. I'm pretty sure this model comes in the, um, the Malignant starter box. You know, the ghost, the, the start playing ghosts, <laughs> Malignants, whatever they're called now. Uh, it's totally worth it. It's a great pickup. This kit is super fun. You get a bunch of extra good stuff in it. Like, if you build the Coven Throne, then you have the Keeper extra, who makes a good, like, Wizard or Necromancer. You get three Banshees extra in it if you build this version. If you build the Mortis Engine, you have three Vampire Chicks you can use as like mounted vampire blood knights or something um i don't know if i've ever i'm sure somebody's done it but i don't know if i've ever seen anybody do a whole unit of blood knights just of these girls riding side saddle i think that would be super fantastic if i if i had any interest in bc i would completely convert that but i already took a bunch of these girls and made them blood crushers out of for my for my demons army so there you go uh very fun i like how this model came out it's big it's uh it's pretty sexy uh and uh, it was really fun to do. Ah, uh, yes, my Morgasts. Um, so these were obviously a pickup later in the game. Uh, more recent type thing. These are some of the most annoying models to do, period. To put together, I should say. They're not that bad to paint. I actually found them to be fairly enjoyable to paint. Uh, it's just gluing them together, especially getting started the initial pieces that you make to build their torsos have to be assembled by a weird form of like sorcerous blood magic uh you have to basically cut your hand and then say a couple of prayers to cthulhu and you know like it's it's really long and complicated there's chicken bones involved i would avoid it um that being said the final product is pretty awesome 
Uh, I thought these guys were really fun. I like the purple scheme. You're going to see why these guys are in purple um, as we go along. Uh, because I, I wanted to, again, as I mentioned, I, I've always had loved the idea of factions within armies. So I wanted to factionalize our group out. And you'll see, you'll see why I use purple and when I use it. Because there's a particular faction led by a particular guy who may be in opposition to the standard Tomb Kings. And he uses purple. You can probably guess who it might be, but don't worry. We'll see very soon. I should do a hobby cheating on those lightning swords. I will probably do that at some point. All right, so my Chimerian Terror Geist. Uh, this is truly the most fleshy of rotting models, um, being that it, it does have open exposed muscle and stuff like that. It isn't just bone. But I wanted to Tomb King him up, so he's wearing like the Tomb King's armor plates. He's got the... Uh, he has the Necrosphinx shoulder plate uh, beyond his neck. He's got the snake surfer sort of things on, on his haunches, and he's also got the war sphinx tail as the end of his tail, like bladed tail. It's just little things like that, I think, make him look more Chimerian. That and obviously the turquoise color. I wanted this guy aligned with the, the turquoise sort of section of my army. He's so big and ridiculous that even on that 100 mil base, he just barely fits, and I knew I wanted him up off the ground. So I built myself a little pyramid, and uh, there you go. That's that's him on top of his little pyramid. I don't think that pyramid came out fantastic. I probably could have done a better job of like crack filling and sanding and stuff like that. Uh, but sadly, laziness got the better of me. Uh, that being said, I, I love this guy and how he came out. I think he's super fun and I always love putting him on the table. And I, sometimes I just like to stare at him. Uh, I think this model has the best wings of, of sort of any model that's been done. Um, a good thing if you need to build very simple buildings or structures, I will say, and you might have a bunch of this lying around and not know what to do with it, and that is old plastic movement trays. So if you're not using movement trays anymore in the Age of Sigmar, um, they're really great plastic for doing sort of simple buildings like this or structures. Like if you need a, you need a small square thing or triangle or something like that, you need like a cobblestone street. Well, most of them had grids cut right into them. So... Yeah, you know, don't throw those uh, don't throw those old uh, movement trays away. There's some great stuff you can do with them for converting. They're a soft plastic; they cut easy. You can shape them into things. Uh, that's what I built the pyramid out of, and I I still got a bunch of extra ones lined up for if I ever need big flat plastic. Another picture of the Terror Geist. You can see him from the other angle there. You can see he's also got the Under Armour on. Basically, it's the other half of the snake thing. So. He's got the full full set, and I think it, it works. It makes him look a little more Chimerian. It makes him fit in with the rest of the army because you got those same visual cues in addition to the color. And in case you're wondering, yes, he is absolutely pinned into that pyramid. He's not just glued there by his two little tippy-tip fingers. Uh, pinning is an essential thing for giant models like this, especially something crazy like this guy. He is well driven into that pyramid. <laughs> All right, so now we come to the characters, and we're going to start with the uh, the C team here. This is the low-ranking character, so I've got one of my Tomb Heralds, uh, Mr. Wide Stance back there, because he was actually a mounted Tomb Herald, but I didn't want to put him on a horse, because again, he was for, for more time. So I just said, eh, it's close enough. He's got a Wide Stance. And uh, again, with that zombie arm scythe, well, I, I had a real thing for that back when I started. Um, the guy with the long spear I used as a necrotect because instead of a whip, I liked him with the big spear. I love the idea of him just poking at people like, hey, hey, go. So I thought it was funny for him to have the big reach out and touch you spear on the ground. It looks so ridiculous. Um, and then a couple foot base lich priests, which nothing special, but certainly they've got, uh, they, those guys have gotten plenty of play. The traditional workhorses, those lich priests. Uh, as well, I have one mounted lich priest that's actually painted. There is nothing special about this guy. I dislike him. I don't think he's ever actually seen play, sadly. He's one of the few models in this army that I bet I never have put on the table. But hey, there you go. All right, more characters. Now the Tomb Kings and a rando Banshee. Um, again, I don't mind having a few ghosts in the army. So I thought, you know, doing a Banshee, that's, again, one of the ones from the... It's extra from the Coven Throne. Um, I think the Banshees are, are kind of fun to do. I think they're neat-looking models. And I, I wanted to have a little bit of sort of ghostly influence in my Tomb King, so. Uh, also, you'll notice the purple. 
when it comes to a thing. So here we have both a loyalist tomb king, or two loyalist tomb kings, and a traitor tomb king. Again, we'll, we'll get to that in just a moment and what that means. Uh, but the middle one, I think, is actually my favorite model. He's the metal one, the older one. The other two are obviously just the plastic guys off the top of the War Sphinx. Um, and you can see in none of them did I use the dumb body spewing scarabs, whatever the heck that is. Uh, the, but the, the guy in the middle is one of my more favorite ones with the big halberd sort of pointing. Uh, I don't know why. I just, I really like that guy. He's got a good look to him. He's got a good sort of dynamism in his pose. Uh, something about the way he's coming forward towards you. Prince Apophos, Mr. Uh, Mr. Scarab. There he is. Again, nothing too exciting with him. Uh, super easy model of paint. A lot of, uh, although a lot of those beetles are picked out individually. It's not all just dry brushing. Uh, not a great picture, but there you go. Ah, my sweetheart, my darling, the most beautiful woman in the world of Warhammer, and that is High Queen Kalita. Uh, always my first love in the Tomb King's army. And as you can see, uh, this, this, I've, I've tried to paint her a few times. She is an extremely challenging model to paint. Uh, her body wraps want to look like crap. Her cloak is all haggard. The nature of what to do with her staff, as you can see, I tried three different methods here. <laughs> Right, like each of these uses a completely different sort of staff thing, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I I don't know if any of them are completely successful. They're all interesting, I guess, but like what you paint, where you paint, her details are finicky. Her fine cast is terrible. The middle one is fine cast, and I hate it the most because she's got pock marks I couldn't fix. They're so tiny, but they're just there. I see them. Um, the snakes wrapping around her arms. You know, it's just... She's got a lot of little annoyances. Um, the one... These are in chronological order from left to right. And I think that... the I, I think that the one on the right does look the best. Um, but I'm, I'm not, in honesty, super thrilled with any of them. Um, they're, they're all good or passable. I, the one on the left is passable. The one on the back is pretty hideous because that green does not work. And the one on the right is is decent. There you go. That's my rating. Um, but the one in the back, the one thing I do like is her up on kind of the rock. Um, again, I think that taking characters and putting them up on big things like that, which is super easy to do, like that's just a piece of, you know, MDF cut and then dry brush. Like it's not, there is no sorcery there. Okay. That took the least amount of skill. Um, and then I just put the flying scarab on the front to kind of break it up. So it wasn't just like a big rock. I think doing things like that can help characters really stand apart and look good visually in the army. Uh, so I would, you know, I, I would encourage you, especially in, in the sort of new age where characters wander around on their own, to, you know, think about something like that. Uh, to think about, you know, posing your characters on a more significant base. Something that really gets them up and standing out and looking special. Uh, so my next Sphinx, this is Sphinx six the sixth sphinx uh this one is a tomb prince on sphinx uh obviously the tomb prince is just you know one of the guys out of the back of the, the thing but i like him uh he can be a tomb prince if i want him to he's writing it alone uh i don't like the angle he's posed at that was accidental uh it's a good call to make sure you hold on to the models you're gluing to something all the way until the end when it's really dry because i held him and it didn't seem like it was moving and i let him go and i kind of turned around and looked at something else and when I looked back, he had sort of went and leaned backwards. <laughs> and I was like, uh, and then the glue had set. And I was like, I don't really want to rip him off because I might pull up more gold and then it won't get covered. And I just, I, it's being lazy, I know, but I was afraid of breaking him or ruining the paint job. So I guess he's just the, he, this is the Tomb Prince Michael Jackson. And he just, he knows how to lean it like a smooth criminal video. Um, this was also my first attempt at sort of the airbrush kind of galaxy patterning. Um, I did this quite a while ago, and I think it's uh, I, it's a good point in how on a model of this size you really can get away with it, especially when you've got a lot of that big open flat space. Um, it's it's I, I think it's really a thing you could do in probably 40k or something where you've got big vehicles and a lot of flat space. Like I could totally see doing like Eldar whatever their Eldar jets are called. I don't remember what they're called, but 
I could really see that being a way to pop that off and make that look cool for that Eldar stuff, especially since they're all about traveling in the stars. Uh, never one to waste bits. So, Neferata in purple, of course, because, again, traitor, traitor group. Uh, Neferata, this is the extra girl that comes out of the uh, Mortark box set. Uh, I wanted her to look like she's sort of floating and flying on like a cloud of gas, and I did not achieve that, but that's okay. It was a fun experiment. Um, that is obviously just a stick that is shoved up her butt, and then the whole thing is coated in big stretched out cotton balls. Uh, the problem is I didn't yet have an airbrush. If I had an airbrush, this could have worked. Um, because that's what you really need. It doesn't, you can't really with a brush. And that's me like just taking very watered down paint and dipping it almost. And it's still just, you can't get it in enough. Um, you really need an airbrush to kind of soak it through properly and get the right fading. Um, I, I, I want to try this again sometime and see if I can't probably also soak it in glue so it like hardens up. Um, that was the other problem. Like that's still, I put a little in, but that's still actually rather soft. Um, which just makes the model hard to transport. But there you go. Floating, flying Neferata. And, of course, Big Papa himself. The, 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 well, not really that, but a big... I guess this guy's more like... Uh, he's more like the mace to P. Diddy, right? If, if, if we're, if, and I think we all know who P. Diddy is. That's, that's Nagash. So this is his mace. Uh, Arcan the Black. Uh, I love Arcan. I've I've loved him since way back. I, I the sort of loyalty in his story. He's a very dangerous guy to the rest of the Tomb Princes. They all feared him. Um, just like the way he what happened to him is just such a cool thing. So I was thrilled when they released this model. I always loved his flying chariot. I love that they released this model where he's on the big weird dragon cat thing. Uh, I went and bought this the first day it came out, and. I painted him for about 26 hours straight. I think I slept three hours in the middle there to get this guy done. Uh, super fun kit. My favorite part of this is, again, an Empire guy dying down the base. But it, what I love is if you look closely, the hand that's sticking forward and his front leg that's walking forward are both skeletal. So, like, the way I pictured it was Arcan is casting a death spell on him and he's watching himself turn to dust in front of him. So, like, he's looking at his hands, screaming as, as everything from the front of his body backwards is slowly dying and turning to, to a skeleton. Uh, it was a nice little narrative to me. And once again, sadly, an Empire guy has to die for the beauty of the army. Um, this is a very... Uh, I didn't use all the, the ghosts for this. I saved one of the extra ghosts. And so, as a result, this guy is, again, double-pinned, just like with big steel rods, basically, to make sure he's so he's bouncy but you'd have to really slam him to break him or anything he's he you know traveled all around the country with me and he was in the car for four thousand miles bounced around in a trunk no issues so uh it's a great model i uh i highly recommend again this kit which i think is in the star collecting skeletons kit um the the kit for him you get arcan and all the rest of them i again totally worthwhile to me because this kit is super fun to, to put together um, I also did replace Arcan's little whatever was in his offhand with a big giant ogre sword, because his sword is supposed to be big and deadly and scary, and I wanted it to be scary. You can't really see it in this photo because the angle I took it at, but it's a big sword. Now the big papa himself. Uh, maybe, maybe this guy's the notorious B.I.G., I don't know. But, yes, Nagash. So this is my completely custom Nagash. The only part of him that is actual Nagash is the arms. His little spinny, skindly, skinny, spindly arms are legitimately Nagash. Let's walk through it. His back plate is the back of the mortise engine, the cage. His head is from the Necrosphinx, as is the his sort of shoulder pad. Uh, the front, his sort of the front banner-looking thing is also from the War Sphinx. Uh, his hand and staff are from the Tree Man. The sword is a combination of some random hilt that I have no idea what it's from. The head of Neferata's cat beast, or maybe it's Manfred's, I don't really know. And then the blade is the glaive of the vermin lord. And then we've got the spirit host from the coven throne holding him up under, like, coming out from under his skirt. 
and the skirt itself is just green stuff done with like there's bars underneath to hold him in place um this is how i should have done the first guy oh and then obviously one of the banshees from the Kelvin throne as well um that's how i should have done the other skirt on the hyro titan basically what i did here so if you ever need a big frame to hold something like this or you need a really solid pin the answer is in your house right now for free and that answer is wire hangers so like all of his bumps in the flow of the cape that's all just a framework of wire hanger like just standard wire hanger i went up to my closet i got one i chopped it into pieces and i bent them into a frame that i could then set down into the ground and uh and then just molded the cape around it with green stuff and just kind of pushed it around and then stuck it to the frame just let it dry easy peasy you get a nice big flowing cape and uh all in all i i love how this guy came out uh it's hard to tell size from this picture but don't worry i'll take care of you with the next picture um i like the big spirit hosts on him uh i'm always looking for more excuses to use those spirit host base off the coven throw and i think i think they're just a really cool looking thing and it's fun to have them like that he's sending forth all of these ghosts ah uh, yes so if nagash and his purple leads the traitor legions only one the king of kings the golden hawk right the imperishable cetra so this is cetra obviously and uh he only has one minor conversion and that is i don't like his i didn't like his sword i didn't like that the blade of petra was so kind of tiny and unimpressive uh so i replaced it with a new shopti weapon so now he's got a big Ushapti blade in his hands. It's a good point. Again, I, when I mentioned the Ushapti earlier, I talked about how their scale is funny because they're not that much different than a model of, of like normal man size. Cetra is bigger slightly than a normal 28 mil sort of human, but not that much so. And yet to me, the Ushapti arms look pretty perfect on him. Like if I hadn't pointed it out, I'm not sure you would have said, oh, those arms look way too huge or something. I, I don't think they do. Um, sadly, this guy is fine cast, and so you can see, like, the banner pole has bent some over time, just, you know, where it got warm or something in the car. Uh, I do hate fine cast with a passion, but that's okay. Cetra will always hold a place in my heart. Uh, I love painting this guy. I love this model. I, I used him a ton of times in, in 8th and AOS, and he, I'm always glad to see him hit the table. Uh... I, I, mine is not as cool as Tyler Mengels, who has the best conversion ever. Um, I highly recommend you go hit his site and look at his Cetra conversion. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen. I love his conversion for it. So there you go. There's your classic showdown. Just in case you were curious as to what we're talking about size-wise here. That's how big Nagash is. I think that's pretty accurate to what you see in the picture in the Nagash book when Golden uh, Cetra is taking on big purple wave of death Nagash. Uh, I, th I thought that felt pretty appropriately sized. Um, I have had this fight. Myself and MC1 Gamer had this showdown. I was Cetra. He was Nagash. It didn't end well. That's okay. So after they fought, what happened? Cetra died. I guess spoiler alert for a book that came out a year and a half ago. But um, Cetra died. But he is imperishable. And from the sands of... Nehekara, four voices called out to him and made him a deal and he accepted and stood up and was given a new body and new troops to command and so when i read the end of of nagash where setra's stood up by the chaos gods and you have no idea what he's going to do um turns out spoiler alert more or less nothing in the rest of the four books he shows up in the novelization and that's it let down um but uh but as soon as I read that, I was like, I've got to make a model to represent this. So I took the Chimera, shoved him together with some War Sphinx bits. There's even like a couple Gorgon parts on there. The Mortis Engine cage, again, because that cage is really useful. Let me just say that. The big spiky things, like, it's pretty useful. G get into it. Um, and then the collar piece is from the, uh, the Mortark, because you get like three full sets of those collars, so always awesome for doing more sort of armor stuff or covering over like two pieces that don't quite fit together but you don't want to green stuff them it's a good way to go um 
I also changed like the tail so it didn't have a little face because I didn't want a face on it. So this is the Camarian Kite, or the, sorry, the Chimera. There you go. I suppose it's a Chimera. Chimera. Chimera? I don't know. Doesn't matter. You get the idea. And uh, now he's wearing his golden mask as he uh, strides forth to take revenge upon the Chaos Gods. So this is Cetra on his own personal Royal War Sphinx. But it is not the piece de resistance. So the final thing, the last piece I did for the last March of the Tomb Kings, and truly, as I mentioned back when you saw the three Kalitas, the absolute best model uh, I think I painted in this, in this whole run of my whole army, uh, I, even though I just finished her very recently, I, I think she's quickly vaulted to the top. Uh, I love her. I love this platform for her. This is High Queen Kalita on her personal War Sphinx, uh, which I'm calling Asp Spite. Uh, I love everything about this model and how it turned out. Uh, once again, we've got the Coven Throne pieces in play here, the big uh, banners on the side. Um, we've got some snakes. That's a, like a, a whole jungle swarm or something, like the old metal jungle swarm that I just took apart and scattered the snakes around and stuff like that, which I thought was fun. Um, all in the back of, obviously, the War Sphinx kit. So this sort of represents the culmination of everything that I had been working on, of how I've been doing bone and stone in the desert and my basing and doing the marble of the body of the Sphinx and uh, the way I did gold and the, the sort of extreme contrast of the non-metallic metal style and true metallic metal. Uh, I really do love how this came out, and, and I think that she turned out pretty gorgeous. And I love the way she towers over the battlefield at the top of her form. We've got a few more pictures. We're just going to cycle through her because, in the end, Cetra may rule and may be the king of kings, but Khalid is the ruler of my heart, for sure. So, there you go. There you go. That's sort of that. By the way, on the marble, I do have a tutorial for that. So, if you're curious, uh, I do have... You, you can walk through my latest hobby cheating video, or, or I guess it's episode 27, uh, depending on when you're watching this in the future, and uh, you can see how to do that marble. It's actually not uh, too tricky. It's somewhat a lengthy process, but it's not hard. Anybody could do it. So there you go. We still have one more secret slide. What's the last secret slide? Oh, well, it's Kalita herself. Sorry, I have one more after this. So yes, there you go. Close up on Kalita. Uh, who I, I do think this is the best one I managed to do so far. I'm happy. It only took me four times to get to a version that I think is is decent. Uh, she's still not as perfect as she could be, but I'm not happier. Each time she's improved slightly, and so I'll take it. She's definitely ready to rule. Now, secret slide. Monkey. There you go. We end on the Camarian tiny baboon. I have no idea where I got this. I found him in my bits one day. He's a tiny little baboon, and he's my little Tomb Kings mascot. I don't know why. He just makes me laugh. So I painted him up in my little Tomb Kings turquoise, and he follows my army around and holds a spear. At any rate, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope this was interesting or something to look at or watch or listen to me ramble in the background while you paint. This was a marathon of an army on parade because the Tomb Kings obviously is a huge army for me and it represents sort of years of work and effort. And I, I really do love this army and I hope that uh, you enjoyed uh, walking through it. And I thank you as always. Don't forget to like it if you like it. Subscribe if you haven't already. And always, always. <laughs>